Vaccine passports are no more. And shortly, mask mandates and most of the remaining public health measures to stop the spread of COVID-19 will be lifted. Is it too soon or not soon enough? With us now for more, and we introduce from furthest from our studio to closest to our studio, as is our custom. So let's start in Vancouver, British Columbia with Andre Picard, health reporter and columnist for The Globe and Mail. In Mississauga, Ontario, Sabina Vora Miller, co-founder of the South Asian Health Network and founder of the website Unambiguous Science. And here in the provincial capital, Dr. Peter Uni, scientific director of the Ontario COVID-19 Science Advisory Table and director of the Applied Health Research Centre at St. Michael's Hospital. And it's good to have you three back on TVO tonight. I want to start with a, a, a very simple question and get everybody on the record. Your thoughts on the province's decision to lift the mask mandates by March 21st. Andre, start us off. What do you think? I think it's reasonable to be lifting some restrictions, but the question is which ones should we be lifting and when? I, I don't think we should be uh, rushing to take our masks off. It's not a really big uh, imposition on people. It's useful, uh, it gives us some comfort. So I, I think it's a little soon for masks. I think we should be easing out of things rather than doing everything at once. Sabina, where are you on this? I think it's far too premature to be considering removing masks right now. We still have a very high caseload. We still have under five who are not yet eligible to be vaccinated. We also don't have point of care antivirals and therapies easily available for those who are immunocompromised. You know, masks, masking is something that we can do that is easy to implement. It's very cost effective. Um, and it actually prevents things like future lockdowns. You know, you don't need to have things like stringent capacity limits, etc. Masking really should be one of the last things we left. So we have premature, we have a little soon. <laughs> Dr. Peter Uni, where are you? I think we need more data first. That's, uh, uh, you know, the, the expected uh, response that I'm giving. But of course, that's the point right now. We start to see that uh, there's a slight increase um, in test positivity. We also see a slight increase now in our wastewater of, of a viral um, RNA. And uh, all this just points towards that we just need a little bit more data to understand. Do we just go up a tiny bit and then we stay stable again and are ready for the next step? Or will we just need uh, to wait a little bit longer? Let me follow up with you on that, Dr. Uni, because if you're saying we need more data, I infer from that that you think that the mask mandate is coming off too quickly because you'd rather have more information before making that decision. Is that fair? I believe that the decision to lift mask mandates was communicated too quickly because we didn't have the necessary data to support that. Okay, let's get uh, on the record here. This is a tweet from a virologist in Scotland who said COVID was treated like a once in a lifetime crisis until some remembered we're living in an era of pandemic threats. We can't just shut down life for years every time Hope we will carefully plan, implement, and advocate for sustainable responses with minimal disruption on daily life. Andre, could I get you to react to that? Well, I think that's true. You know, we have to have sustainable measures. Uh, who says that masks are not sustainable? We use them in all kinds of uh, uh, areas. There's, uh, you know, there are all kinds of things we use in our daily lives, uh, hairnets in restaurants, uh, uh, some masking, hard hats. Uh, we have to wear pants when we go into stores. There's all kinds of things that we do. Masks are not a great imposition. They're not very difficult. So yeah, we have to find sustainable measures. Uh, it's very true that we were going to, to ease out of restrictions and we're doing that. The question, you know, as I said before, I think it's when we do it and how, in what order. And masking to me, as, uh, as we heard from the other panelists, I think it's probably one of the last things we should be doing because it's easy, it's useful, and it's cost-free. Let me do a quick follow-up with you, though, Andre, and that is that none of the other examples that you mentioned are as fraught with political overtones and with irritation as wearing masks are for many people. Does that uh, make you reevaluate what you just said? Well, all kinds of things in life are irritating. Uh, speed limits, uh, you know, no, store closure hours. We have all kinds of rules in life that are irritating, but we try and find a, a measure that uh, most of the public can live with. And I think even if you look, look at polling, uh, the majority of people are fine with masking. Sure, it's irritating, but we are also in very unusual times. It isn't forever. Nobody's saying forever. Uh, I know that people get frustrated when we say, well, just a little bit more time because we never seem to know where the end date is, but uh, it'll, we'll get out of this. 
Sabina, if March 21st, in your judgment, is too soon, can you give us a date that would make you more comfortable? You know, I think arbitrary dates absolutely make no sense. Um, I agree with Dr. Yoni that we have to be basing this on data and metrics. I mean, if you look at the way the U.S. is actually looking at removing these mask mandates, they're doing it based on criteria. So the criteria has to do with the case counts. It has to do with hospital capacity, and it has to do with how many new admissions of hospitalizations you're having daily. Now, we know hospitalizations are a lagging factor, so that's another thing we need to look at. We're not adequately testing um, in Ontario uh, for sure, but also in other parts of Canada. So we don't have a good idea what the case counts are. Um, the way I look at it is that we should be considering lifting some of these mass mandates at least two weeks out of March break, because we know that March break people are traveling. There's going to be an increased risk of transmission, especially when kids come back to schools as well. Um, we know that vaccine uptake, um, especially in the 5 to 11 age group, is abysmal at this point, and under 5 don't even have access to vaccines right now. So we need to be considering things like what is the vaccine uptake? What is our case count? What is uh, you know our therapy and our hospital capacity? All of that has to be considered. I, I, I'm not a fan of putting arbitrary dates. I mean, it's not as though the, you know, the virus puts in a calendar invite for one of us and says, well, you know, on this date, I'm leaving. Um, so we have to do it in a very measured and very data-driven um, way. Dr. Yuni, I'm not trying to get you in trouble here with this next question. I really am not. But, but I am <laughs> curious about how this works, because you're the director of the science advisory table. And presumably, you told the Premier and his advisors, I'd like more data before we take the masks off. And presumably, they said, well, that's very interesting, but we're going ahead anyway. Can you tell us how that conversation went? Well, actually, the conversation didn't go that way. You know, what we uh, had... Uh repeatedly is uh, exchanges between uh, Dr. Moore and, uh, and myself. And um, we have uh, qu quite a lot of uh, communication going on. Uh, a, lo a lot of that actually uh, also, you know, just the text messages that we exchange to compare notes. And uh, I haven't heard for a few days then uh, before this uh, decision was uh, communicated, basically, that the uh, mask uh, mandates would be lifted. So uh, so the uh, the situation certainly was uh, that, that we agreed that we are in a stable part of this uh, lifting restrictions uh, because we didn't see test positivity go up. We didn't see um, wastewater concentration of, uh, of uh, viral RNA go up. This was good news. But uh, we are, were also aware, or I tried to make people aware of, that we are too early to tell uh, what's happening with the uh, last um, lifting step, which was uh, on March the 1st. So the point there is that a lot of that is a bit, you know, based on your uh, conditioning and your mentality. My mentality and my conditioning goes into, I want to have data first before I make a decision. And uh, um, what I what I just uh, noticed then, you know, and uh, I, I think that's a fair um, attitude as well. Um, Dr. Moore's attitude would be more like, look, the last reopening steps went well. We did this step wisely for every step, which is uh, documented that we're stable. And we believe that, you know, these uh, three week intervals that we have between steps or this one would be a three-week interval would work out so different mentalities here um uh, you know it, I'm, I'm not suggesting that they, they were wrong with uh, communicating or lifting basically we will see how it goes the point is we don't know yet whether we were wrong with doing that no i appreciate that honorable people can disagree about uh, whether it's today or next week or two weeks from down the road i get that but again i'm just trying to figure out how it works do you actually advise the premier and his people directly, or are you only advising Kieran Moore, the medical officer of health for the province, and then he deals with the premier? Oh, I think things have changed quite considerably now. And, uh, you know, uh, Adelstein Brown would need to basically just uh, contribute to this discussion as well. But you need to understand how it worked in the past was that the, uh, one of the core chairs of the science table and one of the core chairs uh, Dr. Beate Sander of the uh, modeling consensus table, which typically um, brief the cabinet 
and uh, and we would also me also then being present we would uh, basically have discussions with the health coordination table this is something that has changed now you know because we're in a different part of the pandemic and we don't have these formalisms in place the same way anymore and uh, while i was just uh, together with uh, with uh, with uh, dr schwartz just uh, yesterday briefing uh, the minister of health this is uh, has become more of an exception now, and the you know the systems of communications just have changed a bit, which is not necessarily a bad thing. We're in a different part of the pandemic, and I think the you know the these uh, last uh, bits of decision making worked really well. Remember the Omicron wave? This was done relatively informally, but we actually just made it towards the right decisions there. Okay, thank you for indulging me on that. I am always curious as to how these things work out, Sabina. Uh, Okay, how do we get into this here? The masks are going to come off, and uh, for you know, there's going to be widespread disagreement in society about whether or not this is a good idea or bad idea. Some people are going to show up to work without masks on. Other people are going to show up with masks on. Personal interactions going forward are going to be challenging, curious. I don't know what word you want to use here, but can you sort of envisage for us how you think all these, how, how's this all going to work out? You know, I think that when I'm looking at what what it's going to be next week once mass mandates are lifted, I think for me, my biggest concern really comes down to those who are immunocompromised. I get so many messages from those who are immunocompromised, um, feeling like they're being left out and left behind. Um, you know, I think that they're being left to their own devices to risk manage. They're also getting a lot of harassment for wearing masks. Um, by those who disagree with mask wearing. And I think that we need to be at a point where we respect everyone's decision, knowing also that, you know, the immunocompromise especially are most protected when there is bi-directional masking in place. You know, I think we're going to get to a point where the, you know, people who are not immunocompromised are going to be able to do exactly what they were doing before, but now not wearing a mask, whereas those who are immunocompromised are going to be able to do even less um, than what they were that they're able to do right now with um, you know, mandatory masking in place. So I think in terms of interactions, we're going to see uh, you know, a whole uh, spectrum of interactions here with some people having maybe improved or back to normal interactions, but others actually having far reduced interactions because they simply do not feel safe doing even basic things such as grocery shopping. So I think we really have to consider the equity aspect of this. Andre, what's your advice in terms of the literally millions upon millions of interactions that will happen after March 21st, some masked, some not? Well, I'm in a jurisdiction where we haven't had, where we lift the mask mandate a week ago. And it's been interesting to see uh, who's wearing a mask, who isn't, how do you talk to each other? I haven't found a lot of hostility. I've had people say, oh, you don't have to wear a mask anymore. And I say, well, I choose to. And they say, okay, great. Uh, so I haven't seen a lot of that anger or... Uh, so I think that's what it's about. We have to respect each other as we don't necessarily agree. Should we be masked or not? We have to respect that. And uh, that's going to be interesting going forward. This in-between time where we're all trying to find our footing is going to be interesting. But I think, uh, you know, as Sabina said, it's about trying to respect people. That's why I do it, because I don't know who else is shopping in the grocery store. Uh, I tend to go early in the morning. It's a lot of older people. I'm going to wear my mask uh, just to be a good neighbor. So I think a lot of that is going to be uh, about personal responsibility. We hear the per the politicians talk about that that terminology, personal responsibility, but I don't think that uh, should uh, stop them from giving us guidance. Yes, personal responsibility is important, but it doesn't take away the need for guidance and, and public health rules. And I think that's where we've kind of uh, been a bit of a cop out on that uh, side. Can you just give me a, a quick follow up here, Andre, on uh, I think it was last Friday that the mask came off from British Columbia. What, what was the, uh, I mean, overwhelming reaction, if there was one, among British Columbians to the mask mandate coming off this quickly? I think it was kind of a shrug, you know, people say new things were coming. Uh, I think there was much more discussion about uh, why are we keeping our vaccine passports? Uh, that one's uh, still in place. So I, I think that one's a much more uh, volatile one. A lot of people who don't have their vaccines want to go out. So it, it, it hasn't been a really, you know, large reaction. It's just people said, oh, okay, well, I'm going to wear a mask or not. I, I'd say the majority of people still do mask in public places. Okay, Peter Uni, uh, let's just understand again, back here in the province of Ontario, we have already seen at least one school board 
the Hamilton Wentworth School Board in um, in Southern Ontario has pushed back and they said we actually think the students should keep their masks on and the Minister of Education pushed back against them and said well you, you need the permission of the local medical officer of health if you want to do that there are some companies some businesses uh, who are going to want to continue to have mask wearing policies in the province uh, even if the masks come off uh, how do you see all this unfolding I think it will uh, unfold in a dynamic manner as previously. You know, what we've seen in Ontario was actually pretty remarkable. People reacted relatively swiftly to a change of situations. They decreased their contacts. They uh, became more careful. One of the reasons we actually sort of managed with the Omicron wave in Ontario, that was absolutely just people's behavior, even before we implemented public health measures. So what I trust now is that people continue to do their response dynamically, meaning they take it slow now. They uh, don't pretend everything is over and uh, that we will see, you know, perhaps the similar reaction that we saw basically in a BC, what Andre just was, uh, was uh, referring to. Yeah, some of us will wear masks, others don't. If it comes to schools, to be honest, you know, I could have lived very easily with just waiting for two to three weeks. As Sabina also, also has said, you know, we're just after a March break. Do we really just want to make this step? I also see the challenges a bit more, you know, my two small ones are or uh, eight and 10, they, you know, uh, I will discuss with them or already have, you know, that uh, that uh, I would like them, you know, to keep their masks on, etc. But there will be quite a lot of peer pressures and we don't know yet how this will all play out. So for schools, I think what have, would have been the right step probably is just to say two to three weeks longer. We see how it plays out, you know, in the other settings. And then we just take, you know, this uh, last step because schools are a high risk setting. Why? We have all these kids just being in the same class classroom, you know, for six, seven or eight hours. That makes a difference, of course. Uh, okay, a bit of a chippy follow up here to you then, Dr. Uni, and that is you and Dr. Moore disagree on this. He's okay with the masks coming off on Monday and you think a little more time with the masks on would be good. I wonder whether you believe Dr. Moore is succumbing to political pressure from the current government of Ontario to get the masks off sooner. Oh, I don't have any evidence for that. We need to be very aware of that. What I can tell you is just what we see, all of us, you know, that's not rocket science, just to look at this uh, from an international perspective, or, but also, uh, you know, a Canadian perspective. There uh, is this increasing move towards lifting one restriction after the next, and it starts to backfire in Europe. Yeah, by the way, we see all these U-turns of cases. And, uh, and um, there is certainly a certain pressure just, you know, coming uh, just uh, from from this international and national setting, but I don't have any evidence to suggest that Dr. Moore would be under pressure here. And uh, I made a statement, you know, uh, that was was interpreted accordingly um, in uh, Metro Morning the other day or so. So just to clarify that, this may be entirely uh, Dr. Moore's decision. And I hope in the next few days or so, when the dust settled a bit, I have an opportunity to talk about this with Dr. Moore. Understood. Andre, start us off on this. You know, uh, you're in British Columbia. British Columbia is a big province. Ontario's even much bigger. COVID has not hit these two provinces in the same way. Uh, I know here, for example, in Northern Ontario, where you're from originally, or uh, on First Nations reserves around this province, uh, COVID has had and continues to have a disproportionate influence. Should we have made the decision to say masks can come off in some areas where the numbers warrant, but maybe masks should stay on in other areas where we really haven't got this completely under control yet. What's your take on that? I think it's a, actually a complex question about how do we manage uh, just the simplicity of messaging, like a single message I think is really important, but how do you adapt it locally? So I think uh, there's no proper answer to that is, yeah, maybe. Ideally, we should have little local rules, but they're hard to manage. So I think it's been easiest to have central provincial rules. Uh, and that's just simple. Uh, so I, I think, you know, I, in an ideal world, yeah, we would adapt to every little local condition, to every bit of data, but that's not uh, practical and it's not realistic. Sabina, what do you think on that? You know, I think that one size fits all approach does not really work in pretty much every setting that we've looked at in the last two years. The one thing that we know that even if we're trying to simplify things 
or we're trying to um, you know, make things equal, we know that backfires, that one size fits all has time and time again not worked. I think taking a more local, hyper-local, targeted approach is always, always um, going to work in our favor. And I think over here as well, we should be taking a similar approach to the way the US and CDC has done. We take it based on the region, based on metrics and, and uh, you know, have these policies in place, um, looking at what the data actually says. Dr. Yuni, should we have taken a more hyper-local approach? I'm not sure. You know, it's it's it, this is less than black or white. I see the communication issue. It's much easier to say, okay, we still have a mandate. You know, few more weeks, and uh, you know, it will uh, be very soon that we can lift it. Just not right now. But uh, what we see in wastewater, for example, is really that uh, the response now to the last reopening step may be a bit different. You know, in the GTA where things are still more okay than in other places of the province, would this mean that we probably should be a bit more careful in these other places. Perhaps we will see how it plays out. Well, we've mentioned Dr. Kieran Moore, the Medical Officer of Health for the province of Ontario, a few times already. So it's probably only fair here that we let him speak for himself. And here's something he said the other day. He said, well, this does not signal that COVID-19 has disappeared or that the pandemic is over. It does mean that we have come to a place where we know what we need to do to manage this virus and to keep each other safe. He said that actually back on March the 9th. Sabina, you want to react to that? Do you think he's on the right page with that? I mean, we do know what we need to do to keep people safe. And I think masking is one of those things in our, in our toolbox that actually works really, really effectively. But here we are still... Um, I, I personally feel removing mass mandates, um, you know, where the science and the evidence simply, in my opinion, does not follow. I mean, we have two solid pieces of data that just came out from the U.S. looking at um, masking in schools, and, and they compared schools that had partial uh, masking versus no masking versus mandatory masking. And there's a huge difference there in schools that had no masking or partial masking versus those that had mandatory masking. You know, 72% reduction in COVID cases. And again, I think we come back to the point over here that we have tools in our arsenal that we can use to try and make sure, um, you know, that uh, we're, we're trying to limit the spread of, of the virus. We have to look at things like long COVID, what the impact of of long COVID is going to be, what the impact's going to be in children who are not yet vaccinated. Um, and I, and yes, I agree, we do have tools, we're just not using them. Dr. Yuning, when you hear that comment from Dr. Kieran Moore, do you wonder whether he's following his own advice? I think he is following his own advice. One thing which is really important is at the sequence is right, we lift mask mandates last. I agree with Sabina. As, I, as we said before, it's probably a bit too early. More data would be needed. And one other point which was really just brought up by Sabina is really important. We don't know yet how the risk of long COVID will be with the Omicron um, wave that we're seeing right now. Is Omicron resulting in a considerably lower risk of, a, of a long COVID? Or how does this look? It's, it's simply too early to tell. So, you know, from, from, a, from all of these perspectives, it just means we would want to avoid that we have a, a, a new wave coming because we're just, uh, you know, too careless. I do not believe it will be a new wave. Why? Because of us as a population, we did the right thing before and we will react dynamically. But to be honest with you, if we do what my original home country, Switzerland, does, pretend everything goes back to normal, you know, wonderful, you know, there is uh, no masking needed. We, we, uh, we basically just meet everywhere contacts back to normal as before uh, as as uh, if we were before the pandemic this can backfire and then we would just create a new wave and we wouldn't like that so the scenarios that i think about right now is we do that step wisely we wait that the weather gets a bit better quite a lot of people like andre or Sa as, as sabina and myself will continue to wear masks nobody bothers that we wear masks and we see that, you know, in terms of mutual respect, we just want to move a bit further before we just lift everything. Well, let me follow up with Andre on that because, uh, and I'll set up the question this way, Andre, uh, America and Canada are very different places and we have heard multitudinous stories about the fact that people who wear masks in the United States often come under considerable opprobrium from those who think the mask mandates are ridiculous. And I wonder whether we might just be the opposite on that, that when next week comes, 
and the people here who want to go mask less, maybe they will be in the crosshairs of those who think we ought to be keeping the masks on. You got any concerns about that? Well, I'm hopeful that I think Canadians overall are pretty mellow people, pretty respectful. And I think I, I wrote a column on this just the other day saying that's what we have to do, just to respect uh, each other's opinion. Uh, life is not a trucker convoy. I think most people out there are quite uh, decent with each other, uh, understanding. Uh, I was on an elevator the other day. I had a mask on. Someone got on. They started being very Canadian, apologizing profusely, so I don't have my mask. And I'm like, listen, we can all make our own choice. I, I think that's what we have to do in this this in between period is just give each other some slack uh, on this and life goes on that is a very canadian anecdote i have to say <laughs> yeah and which i'm sure many people listening and watching to us right now have also experienced themselves dr uni um you mentioned pretending is not a great strategy uh, just a moment ago and i want to compare two countries here not your original switzerland but uh, we've seen numbers from denmark and south korea denmark dropped the mask mandates South Korea kept its mask mandates. South Korea's numbers don't seem to be any better than Denmark's. What are we to infer from that? So um, I, I think we, we really just have a bit of a different situation, you know, just in, the, in these two places. Um, I don't believe that you that you can compare it because the social situation is different, the background immunity is different, etc. And again, you know, as I said before, what you see in in, uh, in places like Denmark or Switzerland just indicate you once you lift all the restrictions, you will experience a wave. Um, we won't start from scratch here because we have experienced an Omicron wave that we controlled relatively well. And what then happens if you lift all restrictions and go back to normal, you will need roughly, that's what we see in Iceland, in Denmark. And it probably also, you know, depending on the situation and the social circumstances, etc., could happen in other places too, that roughly about 45% of the population will need to get infected before um, a wave starts to peak and we start to see numbers go down. Now, if you just reach these 45% in an, you know, in, in, with an extreme peak, your way to go down is a long way. And what happens is that once you're down, you know, at the end of the wave, you have infected 90% of the population. We would like to avoid that and this won't happen in Ontario. Hmm. Why? We already have roughly perhaps 25 to 30 percent of the population now infected and we just have to go probably another 15 percent or so of the population. Once these 15 percent are infected, we start to be not wobbly anymore, but relatively stable and continue to go down with our numbers. No? So you need to be really careful. The background immunity that we have, you know, in various places is different. It depends on the vaccination role out, but it also depends on how many people were actually infected. And when you look at Denmark, you know, they had a considerable delta wave already, which again helped with the background immunity of the population. Sadly so, but it's a fact. Okay. In our last five minutes here, let's look at next steps. And Sabina, maybe you could start us off on this. We are obviously, for a whole bunch of reasons, not testing now in as widespread or as deep a way as we did when this thing started, or frankly, for that matter, even uh, two or three months ago. You got any concerns about that as we start to take our masks off? You know, I, I, I have, I, we're at a point where we need to invest into our infrastructure, especially into testing infrastructure, because that is what's gonna guide us in terms of what we're gonna do in next steps. If we wait for hospitalization numbers, knowing that they're a lagging factor, you know, we, we're, it's gonna to be too late. We need to be proactive. We need to be using preventative measures. And the reason is because no one wants to go into another lockdown. I don't want another lockdown. You don't want another lockdown. No one wants lockdown. And the way we can do that, the way we can actually prevent having lockdowns and other stringent me measures in place is by having things like masking and testing and some of the other infrastructures in place so that we don't actually get into more restrictions and in fact we're able to continue to loosen things as we go along. Um, so absolutely I think that we have to be investing into our infrastructure in the next coming weeks. Andre what's your view on that? We've really de-emphasized testing uh, a lot more more recently than we did say six months ago. 
Well, my concern is not, it's not just testing, it's what are the metrics when things go south again? You know, if numbers start spiking up, that's the problem. The fundamental problem with what's happening is I, I can live with restrictions being lifted. I, I think polit politics matter that we have to respond to the public being fed up. That's all okay. But I don't like having an arbitrary date. Well, we're dropping an arbitrary date. So what's going to happen if things go bad again? Are we going to have an arbitrary date to bring back masking or or vaccine passports? That's what's lacking in here is why did you do it? What's going to be the trigger to act again? That That's my biggest concern. And testing is obviously a part of that. Uh, I don't think we have to do testing like we did in 2020. It's a different world. But we have to use our testing more smartly. And we have to use it as a, a trigger for action, uh, whether it's positive positivity rate or whatever. We don't have to pay as much attention to cases, but we have to have measures, hospitalizations, positivity rate, and make them clear to the public. Here's what's going to happen if things go badly again. Yeah, Dr. Yuni, the Premier has always said he's always been happy to be criticized for moving too slowly. He's always said, I don't mind being the most conservative, cautious political leader in North America, keeping the schools closed longer than everybody else, keeping the masks on longer than most. He's been content to be labeled that way. However, if we end up taking the masks off and things get bad again, how difficult do you think it's going to be to convince people to, okay, we got to take some steps backwards here and put masks back on, ramp up the testing again, maybe lock down again? Uh, who's going to welcome that news? Um, okay, there, there were quite a lot of elements in there that I don't think will happen. One is the lockdowns. I don't think we will see, uh, again, restrictions at the same level as before. Why? We built up so much short-term immunity right now that the, if there would be a wave, this wave would not be as steep as before and would peak at a lower level than before, which is, you know, good news still. Then, you know, the other part uh, really is, I think, if the measures we're talking about would be go back to masks and, you know, re-intensify the rollout of third doses. I'm not a sociologist, but I would believe based on the previous, you know, uh, experiences I had with this, with this population here in Ontario, people would just say, okay, let's just get this done because we don't want to have uh, further restrictions, etc. So I think we should be okay. If it comes to, you know, testing, etc., what we need to be aware of, you know, a test, a, a PCR test, $40 per test. If you do 60,000 of those a day, that's 2.4 million uh, Canadian dollars every day here in Ontario. It's a lot of money that's not financially sustainable. We need surveillance systems. One we have already, that's wastewater. We need other surveillance systems that are based on individuals, of course, and we need uh, just a careful monitoring of the situation in the hospitals too. Is this, you know, potentially as good as what we had before? The answer is yes, if we do it carefully. Wastewater, for example, gives you a much more reliable signal that doesn't depend on your testing strategy and behavior of people than uh, what we've had before. So we just need to use the tools we have wisely. And yes, things will change over time. If we test, we need what we need to do there is just to have a test uh, to treat strategy, and this will need to be brought to the communities. That will be really important. We see again and again, you know, that those people who are who are in, uh, in mo most marginalized communities are struggling most. Worse prognosis, still lower vaccination rate, and we need to bring treatments like Paxlovid to those people. And this only works if we test early enough and if we have a possibility to communicate to people, listen, you're at high risk. You would actually be able to get an antiviral like Paxlovid. Please get tested early. This will not be easy, and we need to work on that during the summer. Understood. I want to thank the three of you for coming on to TVO tonight and so eloquently sharing your views. Andre Picard, Sabina Vora Miller, Dr. Peter Uni, Godspeed going forward, everybody, and thanks for showing up on TVO tonight. Thanks a lot. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.